What's this? New missile changes? Well, that sounds exciting, and I'm sure it's not going to affect my ships at- ah! Ahoy, mateys and gentlemen. I'm Captain Thorn, and welcome back to From the Depths. Now, I'm afraid we're going to have a fairly short episode today, because we're not going to be attacking the Deepwater Guard. As the introduction suggests, there have been missile changes to From the Depths, and... Well, they don't really leave us in a very good position. The Cutthroat, for example... Well, it's more than doubled in material cost, which is simply something I cannot contend with. I've had a very busy week, and unfortunately, having just looked at the missile changes, I don't have a chance to go back and alter all my ships to be a little bit more useful and buildable in the campaign. Of course, we're in a bad position, having just beaten the Deepwater Guard and needing to make a move on the Onyx Watch, which of course means we need more ships. Ships which I just can't afford to build at this price. If we have a quick look at what this update has done to us... Our subscriber submarine, the HHK Rathlos, has more than doubled in cost. The Cutthroat has more than doubled in cost. The Jank Copter, that piece of garbage, now costs 11,000 materials. And it can't even do anything. The knife head is now 93,000 materials. I just can't cope with this. So, in the week to come, I'm going to have to make some major changes to our ships to make sure their combat capabilities are up to scratch and their costs are down to something reasonable. But for now, what I thought I would do is give you a short interlude video to introduce you some of the ships we've used in our campaign till now in a more detailed view, as well as giving you a quick overview of where we stand in the campaign at the moment, which has been requested by one of my subscribers. So without further ado, let's move on. Let's start with the original and my personal favorite, the cutthroat that you all know so well. She was always intended to be a starter ship, and she's got us through every single battle in this campaign, save for a few mop-ups that were done by the knife head alone. She's not wonderful, but I love her. Her main weapon is this, cannon. It's got four barrels, and it fires a shell which looks a little bit like this. Three solid warheads and a hollow point head. It does good damage against the deep water guard's weak wooden armor, but it probably wouldn't hold out against anything stronger like the Onyx Watch that we're about to come up against. Of course, besides that, she's also got the Saw. You've all seen what this thing can do. It really tears through opponents, but it's not had much luck in getting much hits in recently, simply because we're up against faster ships and we just can't catch up. We've also had a weakness in that our third weapon, these harpoons, which have been mounted on the sides, have simply not been pulling their weight. If I was to redesign this craft for future use, what I would consider is having an underslung turret-mounted harpoon launcher that can drag things up close to the cutthroat and allow that saw to get to use, which is a major source of damage. If this saw gets spinning and gets in contact, ships just get ripped apart. She also has, if you've noticed very diligently, a couple of weapons up here and up here. These have just been decorative. They don't do anything. Uh, they can't even fire. I purely put them on to make them look a little bit orky, a little bit scrapped together. She's got a couple of flares on the back and this big sensor tower, which appears red in build mode because it's made of a cannon that isn't connected to anything. But this... Uh, is turret mounted and turns to face the cutthroat's primary target to give relatively accurate sensor information so that the cannon at front can engage enemies properly. Let's have a look inside. Whoop, there she goes. Heading inside the cutthroat we can see this big ugly blocky section which in fact houses a secondary AI which purely targets the crane and is set to target a new enemy 
uh, a new block rather on the ship every few seconds so that the crane will ideally sweep through the target, destroying block after block after block. Here we also have the command room which is mostly for decoration but this is if this uh, console here has gotten destroyed, which it has in the past, we lose control of the cutthroat and it's simply not very effective when it's not player controlled, which has been a bit of a downside in the past in terms of putting out video content and that I'm well aware of. Heading down into the bowels of the ship, we have a little ammo storage room here. Uh, this seems like it's a bit of a weakness, but actually this place has never really gotten destroyed, I don't think. What has been destroyed fairly often, despite having reasonable protection, is uh, the engine. This has uh, broken down quite a few times. And heading a little bit further along, we have a series of deadly blades which keep the cutthroat above the water. The reason why she sinks when the engines stop is because these simply do not provide enough lift without engine power to keep the cutthroat above the water. She's a little bit too heavy, she's a little bit too unbalanced. All things I need to refine when I make future designs. And of course in here we have the array of harpoons with an inordinate number of winches. I still don't really know how these things work. The reason why the ship and most of my ships now cost so much is because all these missiles are lure controlled. And lure receivers now cost 2,000 materials, which is absolutely ridiculous. Well, in fairness, it probably makes a lot of sense. Lure missiles can be incredibly powerful if they're written properly, which mine really are not. And finally we have the AI for the cutthroat which is protected by a nice little stone wall here with metal outer armor and a little metal shell around the turrets in it as well which in fairness have not done it very much good. This turret seems to get destroyed very easily. It's a weakness that I have to work on if I'm going to use the cutthroat in the future. So that was all for a quick look at the cutthroat. Let's see how she does in a few test battles. My favorite ship to fight is this over here, the Deepwater Guard Walrus. It's big, slow, and just about useless, but that makes it a fun thing to bully. Let's see what you can do, Cutthroat. As you can see, the front of the ship is riding a little bit too high, meaning that cannon cannot shoot. Just another weakness of my design philosophy, which isn't great, but I've always admitted I'm not wonderful at building ships. Let's see that crane get to work. There we go, tearing through the walrus nicely. At this point, the harpoons should have dragged it in, but they just aren't working right now. Another thing I'll have to change in the future. Because of this, I have to keep maneuvering the cutthroat to try and get the saw back into position. And it's slow, and it's not really doing the damage it needs to be doing. By now, this thing should be history. There we go, it seems to be AI dead. And that's that. So much for an easy target, let's see how it fares against a very powerful ship, the likes that we don't usually see in our campaigns. At 4000 volume, the paddle gun prototype is much bigger in terms of mass than our cutthroat. And that gun can do some serious damage. We're not likely to be able to take this thing out in a fair fight. At least not without the harpoons coming online and doing some serious work. There we go. Getting knocked back by that. And the cutthroat is already sinking. 
You can see we have a weakness to things which hit our engines to take out those areas of the ship. We just don't stay afloat. And of course, if I, the player, am not on this ship when it starts to sink, the whole vessel will be destroyed. For our next vehicle, let's take a look at the Jank Copter. Originally costing under 4,000 materials, it's now a whopping ridiculous 11,000, which makes it just utterly unusable for the very, very low damage that it does. I originally designed this to be a very, very cheap drone type ship that I could spam and that would draw fire away from our cutthroat, but while it does draw attention from enemy ships, it simply does very little damage. Its primary weapons at this point in the campaign have been simple fragmentation missiles guided by a very very simple Lua script and they just don't do enough damage to be viable especially when the jank copters themselves tend to lose their propellers and fall into the sea or crash into mountains as we've seen in the past. The only advantage they do seem to have is that they're a little bit difficult to hit because of their janky movement. Anyway, with that, let's have a look inside. The jank copter is incredibly cramped inside as you might imagine for such a small vehicle. It's got ammo all over the place. And that, while it sounds like a major disadvantage, the ammo I don't think has ever been destroyed. And that might be in part due to its metal casing and the jank copter's difficulty in getting hit. It's got a few advanced control blocks controlling the rotors, making it move left and right, up and down, but that's about it. Anyway, let's see how well this thing fares in battle. Just about the only vehicles that the jank copter can realistically expect to defeat are very simple deep water guard airships like this, the Hoplite. Please don't embarrass me. At 17.9 meters per second, the jank copter is actually very slow for an aircraft or a helicopter. Here's a quick look at its stats. With a volume of only 314, it's considerably heavier than the Hoplite but lower than most other airships. Those Lua missiles are so overpowered, huh? That totally justifies the 2000 uh, expense for each Lua transceiver. And there goes the hoplite, I think. So Jankopter, not completely useless, but not exactly a fantastic design. Let's see how it fares against something much more competent and dangerous. Here's a Falkenheim, a big scary deep water guard airship. The Jankopter is of course never going to win this fight, but let's see how long it can survive. Up close like this, I don't think it's going to last for very long. And there's that janky movement, sending it crashing straight into the Falkenheim. Good job, Jankcopter. I never loved you. And that's that. Next, my most recent design and one of my favorites in this campaign, especially due to its effectiveness, the Knife Head. Originally coming in under 40,000 materials, it's been very, very, very effective for its cost. Its primary weapon is a single very, very large cram cannon, 
capable of doing some serious, serious damage with all of its hardener and explosive pellets, which let it penetrate very high levels of armor, as well as doing serious internal damage. But with a reload speed of t almost 20 seconds, it's a very, very slow firing weapon. Up until now, the secondary weapons of the knife head have been these simple fragmentation missiles with a very simple Lua script to guide them. But with very large numbers of them, eight on each side, they've been capable of doing very, very high damage. The knife head's interior is actually fairly cramped. There's only a single control room here with no exit. And when we have a look further in, there is very little space. We've got an AI protected by some wooden armor. Wood, because stone might be a little bit too heavy for an airship. As well as a battery. Just like the jank copter, the knife head is powered entirely by RTGs. And it has a secondary AI here for aiming the missiles. The actual bulk of the knife head up at the top, the balloon, is primarily empty space. There are eight different compartments separated by wood and light alloy blocks and with some ammo barrels scattered about. A strong hit on the side which takes out some of the light alloy will very likely destroy only one or two ammo barrels. And of course that leaves a hole in the knife head through which helium can leak out, but hopefully only puncturing a single compartment, giving us plenty of lift to stay in the air. And of course the knife head, I believe, only managed to sink into the sea once when we were fighting against the Prowler, and that was a very difficult fight for us. In combat, the knife head's a bit of a monster. That cannon is serious. While only packing light all ally armor, it does manage to shrug off a lot of firepower simply by being relatively fast and hanging about in the air. It moves at a speed which can clo get close to 25-30 meters per second if it's not turning. Absolutely shredded. Let's see how it fares against a much stronger opponent, the Simoon. This might be a very, very difficult fight for the knife head. Especially since its main weapon, that cannon, is primarily anti-ship and struggles against air units. Its own armor is primarily sloped, and you can see that has the advantage of bouncing some shells right off. The knife head is actually doing better than I expected in this fight. I thought it was absolutely going to lose, but... Here it is, knocking the Simoon to the ocean. Chalk one victory for the knife head. Finally, let's have a look at a ship that I don't know too well. The subscriber craft provided by Wistlove, the HHK Rathlos. We've only seen it in two fights so far, but it seemed to be very effective, of course, at Currently 61,000 materials, it's fairly pricey. Originally it came in at, I believe, 27,000 materials, making it a nice, cheap, early game submarine. 
I've been told that the ship will be very effective against the Onyx Watch, so I'm quite looking forward to seeing how well it does in our campaign. But until then, let's test it out against a few weak deep water guard ships and see how it does. I spawned in a Wanderlust to try and take this thing on. It's a good example of a regular deep water guard design and something we should see fairly regularly, although we've only bumped into one during the campaign. Can the Rathlos take it out? I think that's a definite yes. Where is the Rathlos? That is the question. Well, the Rathlos does not seem to be attacking the Wanderlust. I have the feeling that due to the missile changes, it cannot currently see the Wanderlust because of the sensor limitations in my game. So let's turn those sensor ratings up to one so it has perfect sensor information and see how it does. Ah, with automatic detection accuracy turned up to one, it immediately starts fighting, firing off missile after missile, torpedo after torpedo, and getting that cannon up and running. The Wonderlust, which I chose because of its LAM system, does not seem to be capable of taking out the missiles from the Rathlos. And that cannon and has punched a hell of a lot of holes in this thing. This seems like a very effective design. But this seems like something that'll make mincemeat out of the Onyx Watch. Again, I'd like to thank Wistlove for providing me with this design. I'm looking forward to seeing more of it in the campaign, and I'm sure I'll have a chance to spawn in some of the other ships that my subscribers have provided. On the subject of the campaign, I'm going to finish off today by providing you with a quick overview of the situation at hand. All our ships are just down here in Janwall, having recently conquered the sandbanks by destroying the Davy Jones outpost ending the threat of the deep water guard to us. We're going to have to establish a small base here and ideally protect it. But I don't think we're going to receive many attacks in this direction from the deep water from the Onyx Watch rather because their main forces where we will be heading are up here towards Cold Lock. Another option I could have taken for my next target would be the White Flayers but I think that would be suicide. I'm simply not good enough at designing ships at the moment to be able to take them on. And the lightning hoods which are over here are even stronger. So the plan of action is we will send our ships, mop up some of these remaining deep water guard tiles to gather materials and move on to the Onyx Watch in the next episode. As for our current forces, we have one HHK Rathalos. We have a small force consisting of jank copters and a cutthroat, which almost certainly are going to have to be changed. And we have a knife head here, and a second knife head over here. Providing us with a lot of vision are our two satellites, which I'm moving up to try and provide an overview of the Onyx Watch territories. We also have our main shipyard, over here in the bottom corner, as well as a currently functional drill, gathering a few of the remaining resources from here at Eriwick. I was asked, at the moment, how am I providing supplies for my ships? The simple answer is, I haven't been. Um, the only ship at the moment which can run out of supplies is the Cutthroat, which uses a fuel engine, whereas the jank copter and the knife head both use RTGs. Receiving. The Rathlos uses fuel as well, but that was only spawned recently, so we haven't had any problems there. And it seems to have some RTGs of its own, actually. With that in mind, when we've run out of fuel on the cutthroat, which has only happened on a couple of occasions, I've simply replaced the fuel tanks. 
That's not a very good long-term strategy for efficient material use, but given that we were just attacking the Deepwater Guard, it didn't seem worthwhile to build a supply ship with our very, very limited materials. In the future, when we spread further out and attack the Onyx Watch, the White Flayers, and even further abroad, we're definitely going to have to have proper supply ships ferrying fuel and materials back and forth. As for materials, we've gotten most of those from destroying the Deepwater Guard. They've provided enough for us to repair as well as build a few more ships, but we haven't managed to gather anything outrageous, so my current initial difficulty settings haven't been tweaked. They remain as they were at the beginning of the game, giving us the maximum number of resources from destroyed enemy ships. Once we take on the Onyx Watch, I'll have another consideration of my difficulty settings and see what can be improved. I apologize for the rather unconventional interlude episode, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can appreciate my situation, and I promise I'll get my missiles fixed and all my ships back in working order, hopefully with a brand new ship ready to start our attack against the Onyx Watch next week. Until then, I just want to say I really appreciate all the support you've all been giving me on these videos, as well as the subscriber craft and the constructive criticism. As a new YouTuber, starting a new series, which I'm not particularly good at, I really do appreciate all of your help, all of your feedback, and all of the support you've been giving me. I'll leave you with this large battle in the vehicle designer, and I'd just like to say thank you once again to everyone who's contributed. It's really quite humbling. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, I've been Captain Thorn, and this was From the Depths.